What is going on, everybody? It is Treeb from Treeb Talks here, and we're here on a new episode of Discussing. And ladies and gentlemen, I said this, not a lot of people know this, but me and UCF, we've linked up for a video in the past. I had 300 subscribers around then, so there's a, a lot of new people. But like I said, this is the greatest crossover event of all time. You guys have been asking for it. My dog, UCF Jaguars in the building. How you doing, man? Dude, what's going on, man? Appreciate you for having me on again and uh, look forward to talking some Jaguars. All right, dude. I mean, people could have been distracted. If you weren't such a popular YouTuber, they'd probably think I have Gardner Minshew on here himself. Yeah, bro. I'm, I'm out here with the Gardner Minshew thing going on. Uh, we'll see how long I can rock it, man. I don't have as much going on down here. I don't grow as much down there, but, you know, I got the Gardner Minshew crew fever and uh, it's, a, it's a hell of a time, that's for sure. I mean, dude, you just got to keep – that's – I always love – I love a guy with a good greasy mustache, dude. That's what I'm saying. Freaking yeah, dude, I just got to – I, I got I to keep it growing. Yeah, dude. And, you know, I had to come out here because people commented on my position outlook video of it acting like I didn't know who Gardner Minshew was. I had to come out representing the Washington State Cougars right off the bat. So, y'all y'all know that's my squad. I'm a fan of Gardner Minshew. Speaking of Gardner Minshew, uh, let's talk about him to kind of kick things off. You know, uh, what did you see, if anything, you know, looking at him during his college days that you liked, or what are you seeing maybe in these mini camps that you're a fan of? Uh, I remember, like, I didn't. I remember I've kind of briefly watched him in college football. Uh, I remember because I remember they did some stories about him. But I mean, being down in Florida, I don't really watch much Pac-12 football. Really, um, you know, I like conferences with a little bit better defense but I remember when we drafted him I wasn't all that excited just because you know I watched the senior bowl extremely in depth and I did a video really ranking all the performances and I just looked at these guys really really intensely and I remember in a senior bowl he was like two for 11 with like eight yards so you know I was kind of like okay this guy doesn't have anything to do and then I remember dropping a video right after he got drafted and people were just ragging on me to the point where you know, I saw and I was like, you know, this might be an ill-informed video, so I went ahead and put it on private. But I mean, he's an exciting player. I mean, he's really in an air raid offense. I mean, Mike Leach was uh, really knew how to use him to his best potential. I mean, he's a guy that called him up, and when he became coach, and after the uh, after the other coach commit or the other quarterback committed suicide, and said, "Look, why do you want to be a backup at Alabama where you can be starting over here?" And really, I mean, he took that Washington State team, like really put them on their back and just inspired the whole team and inspired the whole fan base. And, I mean, guys out there, you know, he's like Tebow out there for Florida fans. You know, Washington State fans love him. And he's an exciting player. And we'll, we'll see if he can provide some kind of plug for the Jaguars. So, you know, I was, uh, I was one of those people, you know, uh, when we drafted Gardner Minshew, I'll never forget the notification. I got it right on my phone the second I woke up, not only from the Jaguar app, but from, you know, my Washington State app. Got two push alerts right away. And, you know, I work in the local media here, so – and Pullman's just 15 minutes away from where I'm from. So I was already writing up that report, and I'm like, oh, my God, he got drafted by my favorite squad. I had to hop on YouTube. It was, it was an exciting time for me, that's for sure. Now, he brings the same characteristics, not as a player, but as a personality that Blake Bortles does. And, you know, what, what was kind of, as a guy that didn't really know Gardner Minshew, you know, what was, were you kind of taken back by all this excitement and praise from him? And have you kind of learned to join the appreciation of Gardner Minshew? I wasn't really all that surprised by it because I remember watching college game day and just seeing a special on him. And he's just a funny looking dude with a mustache. And then he's out there rocking jorts. And I mean, he just shows off a pers perfect personality of Jacksonville. Just, I mean, he just looks like a Southern boy. And fans love that. I mean, honestly, the fans' favorite player is the backup quarterback. I mean, last season, up until Cody Kessler got his starts, I mean, everybody loved Cody Kessler before he played. And actually, once he got the start, people started hating him again and they just realized we have no quarterback on the roster. So, I mean, he's a guy that the Jaguars will always love. And, you know, until he goes in there and if he potentially does bad, the Jaguar fans, you know, they'll love him. Now, uh, the, it was a completely opposite factor of last year when the Jaguars drafted Tanner Lee in the sixth round. Everyone was like, who the hell is this guy? Why are we drafting him? Gardner Minshew was the opposite. He was actually an accomplished quarterback in college. He wasn't like Tanner Lee where Scott Frost came over there and, he didn't fit the offense at all. I mean, Mike Leach would have loved to have kept 
Carter Minshew for another year or two. But, you know, his eligibility role, you know, ended after he spent some time in ECU, Alabama, Washington State. And he, I think he went to one other, like, community college or something like that. I mean, he's been – he's really been all over the place. But uh, I'm excited for Gardner Minshew. I mean, we'll – in a perfect world, we'll never we're no, we'll never see him play this year and for the future as long as Nick Foles stays healthy and if he stays at the you know a franchise quarterback a starting level, uh, hopefully we won't see too much of Gardner Minshew. So let's talk about you know last thing on Gardner Minshew. Let's talk more about the player uh, that is Gardner Minshew. So I said in my video personally. I think he has a lot of good attributes. He really can evade pressure, you know, make plays, not, you know, by running the ball, but getting out of the pocket and making sure to find the uh, the open man. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, air raid offense. And I said one thing he lacked was his arm strength. And, uh, you know, when you were looking at film of Gardner Minshew, you know, what did you see that you liked and some things you didn't like? Well, when you look at him, he's incredibly accurate. I mean, I think he had over a 70% completion percentage. I don't have anything written down, but that's kind of at the top of my head through a bunch of touchdowns. You know, he was the second best quarterback at evading pressure, you know, behind Kyler Murray, of course. So I really liked all that about him. Now, the thing that does worry me, though, is a couple things. First of all, is his arm strength. I mean, in the NFL, you have to have good arm strength nowadays to be able to, comp- to, be able to really compete. It's because you got to hit those guys on the out routes. If you can't get the ball there, you know, quick enough, then it's an easy pick six. So the, the arm strength is something that he's definitely going to have to work out work on I know a lot of people compare him to Baker Mayfield but Baker Mayfield's arm strength is incredibly better than Gardner Minshew's and also his height a little bit I mean what is he 5'11 six foot I mean of course the they're kind of it's kind of being overlooked now with the whole height thing now that offenses are spreading out and obviously we had Kyler Murray a guy who was like 5'10 5'11 get drafted in the first round of the or the very number one overall pick in last year's draft and obviously Baker Mayfield was number one pick the year before him he stands at about six feet six foot one so you know the the height thing isn't as much of an issue anymore as it used to be but at the same time uh, I, I you know I definitely like some height on my quarterbacks I'm, I'm kind of a guy that likes bigger players all righty so we're going to be getting off of the backup quarterback and let's discuss the new starter heading into 2019 it's a completely it's a different feeling as a Jags fan because it seems like every year, you know, with even with Garrard, Leftwich, these were guys that we kind of brought in, tried to develop, make them our own guys. This year we have a guy that has done, you know, excellent things already, win a Super Bowl MVP, take his team deep into the playoffs, you know. And there were still some people out there that were not a fan of this signing when it initially happened, and I'm not afraid to admit I was one of those. Uh, let's take it back to the first time the Jags signed Nick Foles. What was your initial reaction to that? Well, I know when we first signed him, I wasn't really all that surprised just because they had been saying for several, like for what, a week or two that it was pretty much a done deal. So by the time it actually broke, it was it was kind of old news. But, I mean, I looked at it, and then you got to see it from a perspective that who was the absolute best player they can get for 2019 at the quarterback position. And that was Nick Foles, whether it be, you know, whether you wanted to maybe draft uh, Dwayne Haskins. Obviously, we wouldn't have been able to draft Kyler Murray or Daniel Jones. If those were the cases, but uh, you look around and I mean, you look at some of the other things that, that had to have happened. You know, if we wanted to get Joe Flacco, we would have had to trade for him. If we wanted to get Case Keenum, we would have had to trade for him. So we didn't have to give up any draft picks, you know, any of that draft capital, didn't have to give up any players. So uh, when you get Nick Foles, you just sign into a kind of a big lucrative deal. And I'm pretty excited about it. Now, of course, Nick Foles, a lot of people say, oh, we just signed an overqualified backup. I mean, uh, Nick Foles had his up and downs through his career. He's never really had an opportunity to actually seize the moment for his team. I mean, uh, the only time he really had a chance to almost have the keys was when he went to the St. Louis Rams, but they didn't help him out very much with like Jeff Fisher over there as head coach. And uh, they wound up, I mean, they, the way they acquired him was that they traded Sam Bradford and received a first round pick, I believe in exchange for, uh, in exchange for Nick Foles. So, like, they were basically saying, okay, we're going to accept a downgrade at quarterback. So, even then, it wasn't really selling into it that much. But um, Nick Foles is a guy that you know, that it took him some convincing to go over to the Kansas City Chiefs after he was contemplating retirement. But um, he's a guy that seemed like he's really rejuvenated his career. He found a new pass for football. He found out um, how to be a pro, what he needed to do to get right. And 
Um, really, Nick Foles, I mean, he's got the keys to the team, and hopefully he can seize it. So we know the obvious argument from everybody on why Nick Foles won't succeed. There's obviously a great deal of people that are like you and me and think Nick Foles will succeed in this Jaguar offense. But there's people out there that obviously think different. One of their major arguments is that the Jags don't have the wide receivers that Nick Foles had, you know, during his time in Philadelphia. Um, are you also going to be making that argument? Or do you think that these wide receivers are going to be beneficiaries of having Nick Foles? Or do you think they're going to, you know, end up being a hurt to Nick Foles at the end of the day? Now, I think with a wide receiver group, I think we do have good players. You know, I really like D.D. Westbrook. Um, I think Chris Conley will come on in a good way. Um, of course, DJ Chark can hopefully develop a little bit. Um, he's got all the tools that he really needs. He's just got to improve his baby hands a little bit. But, I mean, I, I, I like the roster. We, just, we don't really have a true number one wide receiver. But there was a couple things holding back to wide receiver group. I mean, first of all, uh, if you have a bad quarterback, it's going to make your wide receiver group look a lot worse, um, especially if you don't have, like, a true number one wide receiver. And we also have the kind of wide receivers that Nick Foles likes. He likes the big, tall dudes that when Nick Foles drops back, he can throw the ball up and under and to really a spot where only the wide receiver can get the ball. You know, you've got perfect receivers for him, like a DJ Chark, uh, like even if we brought in Terrell Pryor. We've got some big old bodies there at wide receiver, which I like. You know, I like the bigger wide receiver positions. But, um, I mean, really with the wide receiver group, I mean, we haven't seen – really what they can do just because a quarterback play has been super inconsistent, but a great quarterback can uh, make a subpar wide receiver group pretty good. I mean, look at what Tom Brady has been doing his whole career. I mean, he's really only had one truly elite receiver and that was Randy Moss for like a season. I mean, Edelman's pretty good, but other than that, he really hasn't had much to really work with at the wide receiver position, but he's been able to do just fine. So another Thing I want to just talk briefly on this because I haven't really had an opportunity to talk about our tight ends very much because, you know, when you talk about pass catchers heading into 2019 for the Jags, you're really not thinking of any tight ends that are going to be, you know, making a factor, you know, at least in my opinion, I don't think that. Um, and Foles obviously had Ertz in his prime years. Um, do you think any of these tight ends are going to be beneficiary of having Nick Foles as their quarterback? Or do you think that this tight end group is going to kind of be a wash this year? Well, I mean, we drafted – they in the 2018 draft, they were wanting to get a tight end. They, they really were, but the value just never really met. I know they had openly stated that they wanted Chris Herndon, but he wound up getting drafted to the Jets. And then at the end of the draft, they didn't have any tight ends. So this year they were really in a position where they said, okay, uh, we can't just let these tight ends fall again. We had to go get our guy. And that's what they did with Josh Oliver. Uh, now Josh Oliver, he looks like a pretty good tight end. I mean – uh, he's definitely more of a receiving kind of player, but I mean, if you're going to drive the tight end high, you definitely rather get a guy that's going to be a better receiver just because you can find blocking tight ends kind of anywhere. But, um, you know, he's a guy that didn't really have a very good quarterback in college. I mean, you look at his catch radius, he's got a really good catch radius. So um, I think that'll help out Josh Oliver a lot. And like, uh, I think he's going to hopefully make an impact. And I think he's going to uh, maybe not in 2019, but be a real threat in 2020 and beyond once he really gets a hold of an NFL offense and really develops a rapport with Nick Foles. Big guy on Josh Oliver. I've kind of been getting some flock recently because I'm not a big fan of Josh Oliver. I mean, as a player, I think he's fine. But just, you know, as far as fitting into the offense, I'm not sure how well he'd fit into that. But with this offense, though, we have a new offensive coordinator with John Day, Phil Lupo, and obviously him and Nick Foles have that chemistry. Uh, talk about how that's going to benefit the offense uh, heading into 2019. Well, yeah, man, he's he, – the, the cool thing about John D. Filippo is in 2017 when the Eagles – when Carson Wentz got injured, Nick Foles went in there and he didn't do all that great uh, for the couple of games that he did play in a regular season. But they did have the bye week, so – Doug Peterson really took it upon himself to figure out what Nick Foles does well. So he went back to some of the Chip Kelly tape when he threw 27 touchdowns and two interceptions. And he really developed a really good plan for Nick Foles. But you know who was in every single meeting room when that was happening was a quarterback's coach, John D. Filippo. So he was able to pick brains from guys like Doug Peterson, uh, the Eagles head coach, from Frank Wright, who's the, who was the offensive coordinator at the time and is now the uh, the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. So he's not only has he gotten hands-on experience with him, but he's also been around, you know, two other NFL head coaches that 
each had playoff wins. I mean, Frank Wright got a playoff win in his first year as a head coach. So, you know, a lot of brains inside of that room and uh, being able to brainstorm about Nick Foles and um, what he does well with theirs. So, I mean, you know, he was a guy that probably when they hired him, they were probably saying, look, we're very interested in Nick Foles. And they've been developing a plan for him the whole time. They know they, they know how to communicate with each other. They know a lot about each other. So, I mean, really with John Filippo, it's a perfect marriage being able to, you know, bring him in as Yama's coordinator, really bring his guy Nick Foles in as a quarterback. So you know that the fans were clamoring for Blake Bortles to be successful. Everybody. Everybody wanted Bortles to be good, and they wanted him to be the franchise quarterback. That's what they wanted out of Blake Bortles. Now, to end this conversation about the quarterbacks, I'm going to ask you, with Nick Foles, have the Jaguars found their franchise quarterback? Um, I mean, I really, I really hope so. I mean, really, with me and with the Jaguars right now, I'm just at a wait and see. I mean, uh, for the last ten years, I mean, every year has been a disappointment. So I'm, I'm constantly in a mode of, um, you know, cautiously optimistic. You know, expect the worst, hope for the best. I'm not super optimistic about the Jaguars season just because, uh, I mean, uh, the defense looks pretty decent, but I mean, you look around and. It's not a great wide receiver group. It's not a great tight end group, not a great running back group. So, I mean, uh, we'll see with that. But, really, the quarterback can elevate a team. So, I think Nick Foles will be very good. But I, I am in a wait and see mode with him just because he's been around the NFL a little bit. And, uh, you know, he's really only been successful with the Eagles. So, I'm definitely excited about Nick Foles. But, and, you know, you look around and he was definitely the best option. But had they found their franchise quarterback – I don't know for sure. I mean, I'm just I'm 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 in wait and see mode. I already I said this in my last video that this is the storyline. Nick Foles won the Eagles their first Super Bowl. First year in Jacksonville, he has to win the Jags their first Super Bowl. That's how the NFL works. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, I mean, <laughs> just give me all I want is one Super Bowl in my life. That's that's what I'm. That's all I want. I was thinking about that the other day. I was I was talking to my fiance and then. It wasn't, it wasn't great timing because we were talking about, you know, our wedding, obviously. Uh, I just out of nowhere is like, if the Jags win a Super Bowl, that'd be the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it would definitely – it would be – I mean, I don't even know what the feeling would be like. It would be so surreal. I would definitely probably cry. I don't know. I, it's, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's – I can't imagine. I'm so jealous. I mean, there's been a lot of teams out there. You know, Texas never won one. The Titans never won one. Uh, you know, the Vikings, Falcons. I mean, there's a lot of teams out there that have never won one that are just like us where we have no idea what it's like. But, I mean, that would be that would be the ultimate. I mean, man, that'd be – it'd be something. And I, hopefully I can see that day. I've got a lot more life to live, hopefully. So, hopefully we see that day one day. I will literally fly to Jacksonville for the parade. No shit. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd be taking off work. I'd be driving up to Jacksonville. I'd have to I, – I would have to watch the Super Bowl – like around Jags fans just because that would be – usually I like to watch games at home just, you know, with my TV and I usually like to live stream. But I feel like that would be the ultimate experience is being able to watch Super Bowl all around a bunch of Jags fans and being able to celebrate right after. That'd be, that'd be a dream. And then we come back to reality like we're going to go fucking 5-11 and 11 next year. <laughs> anyway guys that was my 2019 uh position outlook discussion with ucf jaguar make sure if you haven't already hit that subscribe button click the bell icon to get notified every single time i drop a new video also check all the other links down below you can like me on facebook at troop talks follow me on twitter at troop talks and follow me on instagram at trayvon pixley man go ahead and plug your shit yeah man subscribe subscribe to ucf jaguar <laughs> so type in ucf jaguar you guys can find me Oh, yeah, they'll find them. All righty, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. And as always, you guys have a great rest of your day.